here in chapter 12, we'll discuss trial by jury. Over the course of the American legal system, the history of the legal system started with judges that determined the facts in a case. This was modeled after the British experience as described in the Magna Carta of 1215. American colonists believed very strongly in the right to a trial by jury. Primary, primary purpose is, the primary purpose of the trial by jury is to safeguard citizens against arbitrary governmental actions. A trial by jury is protected in three areas of the United States Constitution. Article 3, Section 2 addresses trial by jury. The Sixth Amendment to the Bill of Rights addresses speedy and public trial with an impartial jury. And the Seventh Amendment addresses the general importance of trial by jury. Not all litigants are entitled to a, to a jury trial. Exempt are juvenile offenders, adults charged with petty offenses like crimes which authorized punishment is less than six months in jail. Some states offer wider guarantees of trial by jury, and not all civil litigants are entitled to that jury trial. English juries became fixed at 12 in the 14th century. This practice was adopted in the United States. The Supreme Court has ruled that 12 is a historical accident. Less than 12 is allowed in non-capital criminal cases and in civil cases. Some argue that six-member juries reduce court backlog. Social science have found that small and large juries spend equal times deciding cases. Small juries do not exclude important points of view. Jury size does not affect criminal cases. And some evidence shows that 12-member juries are less able to reach a verdict. The American colonies followed the English practice of requiring juries be unanimous. Supreme Court has upheld non-unanimous verdicts of criminal non-capital cases. Only two states permit non-unanimous verdicts in criminal felony cases, and that's Louisiana and Oregon. Juries are chosen through random processes and deliberate choice. There generally are three steps to jury selection. Compiling a master jury list, drawing the, the veneer, and conducting the voir dire. Do these steps produce fair and impartial juries? Well, that's hard to say. A master jury list is names compiled for the com from the community where the trial will be held. Common sources include voter registration, mo motor vehicle records, telephone directories, driver's license lists, and utility customer lists. Historically, some groups have been excluded from master jury lists, like women and African Americans. The veneer is the jury pool. Names are drawn from the master jury list, and they are asked to report for jury duty, or the veneer. Some exemptions are made, of course, for doctors and lawyers and ministers and such. Compliance with jury duty summonses is a major concern. Many people do not report or even ask for an exemption. Voir dire is the examination of a prospective juror to determine if they can be fair and impartial. Process varies tremendously from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Sometimes only a judge is involved. In other places, juries participate as well. Scope and intensity of the questioning varies too, and it can be a short time or a long time depending on the case. Vordire is where each side in the case can excuse potential jurors. Either party can challenge a juror for cause, and that's when the juror is removed because the lawyers and judge agree the individual cannot be fair. Either party can make peremptory challenges when lawyers exclude jurors without giving any reason. Lawyers have wide discretion to use peremptory challenges, but they may not exclude gender, uh, jurors based on race or gender. Lawyers use voir dire for other reasons, like educating citizens about the role of the jury and try to influence how the jurors may view their client. Jury consultants are used in jury selection, which has taken a scientific turn. Jury consultants are used in high profile and expensive cases. They use public opinion polling and focus groups to help write questions for lawyers to use during voir dire. Jury consultants are used more by defense attorneys than prosecutors. Jury duty is the only time when citizens perform direct service for their government. Many citizens appear frustrated when having to perform jury service, but most jurors report being satisfied with the process. Government is trying to ease the burden of jury duty and to get greater compliance with jury duty. 
At the beginning of the trial, each side makes an opening statement, presenting a version of the facts that supports their side of the case. The moving party, whether a prosecutor or the plaintiff, presents its case first in chief. The moving party has the burden of proof to prove up their case. The burden of proof varies depending on if the case is civil or criminal. In civil cases, preponderance of the evidence is the main burden of proof, and that evidence is required of greater weight than the presented by the opposition. In other words, it's something like 50 plus 1 percent. Preponderance of the evidence, a 50 plus 1 burden. Whereas in criminal cases, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Certainty that excludes all other reasonable explanations, which is much closer to a 100 percent burden of proof. Evidence refers to information presented at trial. There's real evidence, which includes objects like guns. There's testimony, which is statements by witnesses. There's expert testimony or expert witnesses, which possess special knowledge or expertise. There's direct evidence that refers to proof of a fact without other information. And there's circumstantial evidence, which indirectly proves a point. Witnesses go through three stages. A direct examination, where they're questioned by the attorney that called the witness. A cross-examination, where they're questioned by opposing counsel. And two criteria for judging evidence occurs. Trustworthiness, only the most reliable and credible information should be used. And relevance, evidence must be related to an issue at trial. Common evidence today, such as blood, hair, firearms, fingerprints, have been controversial in the past because of the science behind their collection. Courts are constantly faced with new technologies to generate evidence, and so the judge has a responsibility to determine the validity of scientific evidence, and they rest primarily on the Daubert case, Daubert v. Dow, in 1993. The most significant recent controversy involves DNA evidence. DNA evidence is now widely accepted and viewed as reliable, being used to open past convictions and has resulted in numerous exonerations. It's the CSI effect. Jurors now expect DNA in every case because of the famous TV show CSI. During trial, attorneys are constantly objecting to the admission of evidence. The judge may rule on the spot or ask the attorneys to present arguments on why or why not certain evidence should be admitted. Inadmissible evidence does, does get presented. The judge will instruct the jury to ignore the evidence or call for a mistrial. Defense attorneys carefully evaluate the prosecutor and plaintiff's case and decide how to react. One early decision is to decide on whether to have a jury or a bench trial, that is a trial only by a judge. Two common strategies are to attack burden of proof and denial. To attack burden of proof is to assert that the moving party did not provide sufficient evidence to convict. The defense is not required to call any witnesses or present any evidence. They can use cross-examination to raise doubts about the quality of the evidence, and many experienced attorneys avoid this strategy unless they must use it because it does not give the jurors any explanation of the dispute. Denial, on the other hand, is the strategy where you deny the facts the moving party presented and offer evidence and testimony to back up, their, uh, back up your view. Jurors are naturally curious about the defendant's case. What is their reasoning? What is their explanation? In a criminal case, the defendant often needs to testify, but is not required to testify because of the Fifth Amendment. After the defense rests its case, the moving party may call a rebuttal witness. That rebuttal witness is used to show the defendant's explanation cannot be accurate. The rules for rebuttal are complex. The moving par party must show that it could not have been used during their case in chief. After both sides have rested or presented their evidence, each party can make a closing argument and allows for each side to sum up the facts and indicate why the jury should decide in their favor. Closing arguments put a favorable light on their case and require considerable skill by the lawyers. Often, emotion, emotional appeals are used on the jury. After closing arguments, the judge instructs the jurors in the meaning of the law that is applicable to the facts. Jury instructions include discussions of general legal principles, specific instructions regarding the case at hand, information about legal standards, and information about possible verdicts. 
The judge and the lawyers each prepare draft instructions. Jury instructions are written out, signed by the judge, and read to the jury. Judges are careful in their wording, but many believe that jurors do not fully understand the instructions given. Studies suggest that jurors often need clarification of the instructions. So what motivates a jury? Well, del jury deliberations are secret, so research on jury deliberations must be conducted indirectly. Research is mixed on what jurors discuss during deliberations. Most deliberations are short and focused on the trial. Votes are taken almost immediately upon entering the deliberation room to understand where everyone is on the case. A lone juror rarely produces a hung jury. Some argue that discussions do not so much decide cases as bring about consensus. If the jury cannot decide the trial, end, cannot decide, the trial ends with a hung jury. The moving party may decide to try the case all over again. The jury, foreperson, announces the verdict or the decision of the trial court jury. After the announcement, either party can ask for the jury to be polled. Juries convict in criminal cases two-thirds of the time, and in civil cases fine for the plaintiff about 50%, which means in civil cases it's really a 50-50 shot. Studies show that juries and judges would frequently agree on the outcome of a case. In criminal cases, the defendant is entitled to a trial by an impartial jury. The jury should not be influenced by pretrial publicity, and pretrial publicity does bias juries. So most trials go unnoticed, so bias is extremely unlikely. Vordire is designed to find any jurors that might be biased and partial. In notorious or high-profile cases, when selecting a jury, it may be difficult, and the judge may issue a gag order an order forbidding those involved in cases from talking to the press. In theory, gag orders can be enforced by contempt of court citation, but in practice they are very problematic because reporters refuse to reveal their sources. Sometimes a change of venue is needed. Venue is the local area where a trial is being heard. A change of venue can be requested to help pick an impartial jury. Defense attorneys must weigh the benefits of a change of, a change of venue with the likelihood of getting a jury with different values, beliefs, and etc. than the one from where the defendant is from. To mitigate the impact of the press on the jury, the judge can decide to sequester the jury. The jurors may live in a hotel and be carefully monitored during their time of service. This affects who can serve as a juror. Sometimes the judge will allow the jurors to go home, but may instruct them not to watch TV or read newspapers. Juries are democratic institutions. They represent a deep commitment to the role of citizens in the administration of justice. Juries resolve disputes that individuals are unable or unwilling to resolve. The settlement of most cases is directly related to past jury verdicts in similar cases. Juries introduce community norms into the legal process, and there is wide variation in verdicts. In federal criminal cases, juries convict at different rates depending on the type of crime. Yet, juries introduce considerable uncertainty in the legal process. So in conclusion, trials are protected in the Constitution and a significant part of our legal history. Jury trials in particular are an essential part of our legal system. Issues surrounding jury size and unanimity, selection and decision making are frequent topics of study. An important conclusion is that there is considerable discretion in the juror's pocket.